Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born in Germany, Peter Thiel moved to the United States with his family when he was a child. He graduated from Stanford and then from Stanford Law School. And after deciding not to practice law, he co-founded PayPal and Palantir, made the first outside investment in Facebook, funded companies such as SpaceX and LinkedIn, and started the Thiel Fellowship, which encourages young people to drop out of college to start their own businesses. Mr. Thiel remains a very active tech investor, now based in Los Angeles. Peter, welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, we'll come to tech and politics and all the matters of current affairs in which you're involved in a moment. First, the deep, the substrate of your thinking. In, a, in an essay you wrote in the early 2000s, you talk about a, an impasse. And you write about the, the Enlightenment tradition which we in the United States have inherited as a kind of treaty or settlement after decades of religious warfare in Europe. Quoting you, the Enlightenment undertook a major strategic retreat if the only way to stop people from killing one another about religious questions involved a world where nobody thought about it too much, then the intellectual cost of ceasing such thought seemed a small price to pay. The question of human nature was abandoned. Close quote. You're famous as a contrarian. There could be almost nothing more contrarian than saying that the Enlightenment represented a retreat. Explain yourself. Well, uh, well, if you want to use a Thomistic category, you can distinguish the, uh, the um, intellect and the will. And the medievals believed in the weakness of, of the will, but in the power of the intellect. Um, and moderns tend to believe in the power of the will, but the weakness of the intellect. And so, uh, I don't know, or to use a slightly different metaphor, if you have an evangelical Christian Bible study, the um, outward facing thing is that people are moral, and that they're good Christians. The inward facing thing is that you're sinful. And if you say, well, I'm in this Bible study and I figured out that I'm, I'm a really good person, you've somehow not quite gotten the message. Um, now, if you transpose this to a um, modern rationalist meetup, the outward facing thing of modern rationalism is that you're more rational, better able to think through things than other people. You're one of the brights, as I think um, uh, Dawkins liked, like to put it. The inward facing thing is that you're not capable of thought, that, uh, that uh, it's basically your mind is full of spaghetti code, um, you can't believe how bad people are thinking through things. And that's, I think, the, uh, the sine qua non of, uh, of, of sort of enlightenment rationality at, at, at this point. And uh, we see it in all sorts of, of, of forms. We do not, we do not trust uh, people's ability to, to think through things at all anymore in the 21st century. I think as a cultural aside, one could say that the the mania we have around artificial intelligence is because it stands for the proposition that humans aren't supposed to think. We want the machines to do the thinking, but uh, it's because we're in a world where individuals are, are not supposed to have uh, intellectual agency of any sort anymore. We, we don't trust rationality. We, we can maybe believe in the wisdom of crowds. We can believe in, you know, in big data. In, in big data. We can believe in, in some sort of mechanistic process, but we, we don't believe in the mind. All right. You continue in your essay to write about the German legal scholar Carl Schmitt. <clears throat> Carl Schmitt has a checkered record. We better uh, state that, but that's not what you're talking about here. You're talking about a particular point he makes. Schmitt offers, a, uh, I'm quoting you again, Schmitt offers an alternative to all the thinkers of the Enlightenment. He concedes that there will never be any agreement on the most important things, on questions of religion and virtue and the nature of humanity. But Schmitt responds that it is a part of the human condition to be divided by such questions and to take sides. Politics is the field of battle in which that division takes place, in which humans are forced to choose between friends and enemies." Close quote. So the well-lived life, the truly human life, the fully human life, requires politics, and politics requires making choices and choosing sides, right? Well, that, now that's putting word, that's putting words. That's what Schmidt would say. It's not necessarily what, what I would say. Okay. What what I, what I would say is that uh, there is something about uh, politics that's deeply adversarial, that's almost irreducibly adversarial. If you listen to a political speech, um, and this is the sense where I think Schmidt is right that if you listen to a political speech, the applause lines are never the positive ways, the positive things you're going to do. 
the, the applause lines are always how we're going to fight the other side, how we're going to unite against the other side, how terrible they are, and we're going to stop them. And um, and that that is kind of this uh, this dy dynamism of of, of politics. Um, and then as a as someone who who's generally libertarian, I'm always very complicated. I would like to live in a world that's less po political, where there's less politics, but I would also like us to be honest about how how terrible politics is. I think I suspect we can't avoid it altogether, but but it is um, it is it is a it's a it's not a it's not a nice it's not a nice thing. Okay, so uh, one more step in this piece of the of the impasse that but you, I, I think you, we should I think we should, I think we should always resist these sort of naive views of politics. That politics are just you know some sort of again some sort of mechanistic process where we take a poll and we all get to some you know syrupy answer that everyone can agree with and that's that's not what politics is about at all. Okay. I'm continuing to quote you from your essay. The world of entertainment represents the culmination of the shift away from politics. The Enlightenment says, well, we've had all these years of warfare over religion, we'll stop asking important questions. Right. And all these decades, these centuries after the Enlightenment, here's the world we've reached. This is the way I read you. You can correct my reading, but let me finish quoting you. Instead of violent wars, there could be violent video games. Instead of heroic feats, there could be thrilling amusement park rides. Instead of serious thought, there could be intrigues of all sorts as in a soap opera. It is a world where people spend their lives amusing themselves to death." Close quote. Now that is a devastating indictment of much of contemporary America, correct? Uh, well, it is. I mean, I, th I think this has been the trend of, of modernity. Now, it's, it's, it's not as though politics has disappeared, though. It's, it's often just gets displaced in various ways. But, uh, but yes, I think there is this, uh, this incredible degree to which um, we've, uh, we've, we've substituted um, the, the realities of politics for these sort of increasingly fictionalized worlds. And, um, and it's probably, uh, that's probably a very, very unhealthy thing. You know, sort of a slightly different frame that I've often given on this is, is that in, um, in the last 40 or 50 years, mm -hmm. there's been a shift from exteriority, which, I, um, which you know, doing things in the real world um, to the sort of interior world, which is sort of in a, in a way can be thought of as a also as a shift from politics to entertainment or, or, or something like that. And, and the, the, um, the, uh, from the, Sean the powerful Connery frame, to Dr. Phil? Yeah, the powerful frame I give is, you know, almost uh, exactly 50 years ago today in, you know, July of 1969, men reached the moon and three weeks later Woodstock began. And with the benefit of hindsight, we can say that that's when, um, you know, progress ended and when the hippies took over the country or, or, or something like that. And then we've had, we've had this incredible shift to interiority in the decades since then. And I would include things like the drug counterculture, I would include um, video games, you know, maybe a lot of entertainment more generally. Um, you know, there, there's sort of parts of the internet that uh, can be scored both ways, but, uh, but certainly there are all these things where we've shifted t towards, the, you know, yoga, world of yoga, meditation, this the world of interior. Therapeutic culture, that sort of... Uh... And um, it, it just sort of super inward facing. All right. Or if you, if, you wanna, if you wanna frame it theologically, you could say it's, uh, it's like, um, it's always the, I always like the uh, quote from Milton in Paradise Lost, where the mind is its own place and of itself can make um, a hell of heaven and a heaven of hell. And this is what, um, and you're, supposed to, you're supposed to be skeptical of that because that's what Satan says when he gets, um, gets sent to hell. He says, well, it's just in my mind. If I just change my mind, you know, right. I, I, can, I can change where I am. And that's not quite true. You know, uh, there, there is an external reality, but, uh, but somehow the temptation to turn everything into um, something therapeutic, something psychological, meditative, has been a very powerful one in, in, um, in the, in the post-1960s America. Okay. This is fascinating, although I should, I should just stipulate, it's, frust it's going to be frustrating because these are deep thoughts and you've read and written and Carl Schmidt is a major, and here we are reducing it, an uh, ox to the size of a bullion cube, but that's television. And now I'm about to do it all over again because from Carl Schmidt to someone who is one of your favorite mm -hmm. thinkers and was a friend of, of ours, we both knew this man, um, until his death a few years ago, René Girard. Mm -hmm. René Girard is difficult to summarize, but a central aspect of his thinking is the so-called scapegoating mechanism. 
In primitive societies, conflict was often resolved by sacrificing a single individual or scapegoat whose death would reunite, would mm -hmm. calm, heal, reunite the community. We see murders like this in myth mm -hmm. and uh, sacrificial practices in the classical world, so forth. Okay. Once again, Peter Thiel. For Girard, there remains a denial of the founding role of violence caused by human mimesis, that is the human desire to imitate mm -hmm. each other, which is the source of a great deal of trouble in his thinking, and therefore a systematic underestimation of the scope of apocalyptic violence. What if mimesis, our urge to imitate each other, drives others to acquire nuclear weapons for the sake of the prestige they confer? The world that best describes this unbounded apocalyptic violence is terrorism, close quote. There's a lot there, but, but René Girard is in some ways the, a, addresses an aspect of human nature well, it's, in some, yes. it's, it's the very thing that the, that, that the Enlightenment says, no, 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 don't even think about such things, right? Yeah, well, the Enlightenment always whitewashes violence. That's it. That's so it. Um, it's, it's it. one of the, there are many things we can't think about in, under Enlightenment reason, but one, one is certainly violence itself. And, uh, and if you go to the anthropological myth of the Enlightenment, it's the myth of the social contract. And yes. so what happens when everybody is at everybody else's throat? What the Enlightenment says is, everybody in the middle of the crisis sits down and has a nice legal chat and draws up a social contract. And that's maybe, maybe that's the founding myth, the central lie of the Enlightenment, if you will. And what Girard says, something very different must have happened. And when everybody's at everybody's throat, the violence doesn't just re, uh, resolve itself. And maybe it gets channeled against a, a specific scapegoat where the war of all against all becomes a war of, of all against one. And then somehow, gets resolved, but in a, in a very violent way. Um, and so I think you know, what, what Gerard and Schmidt or Machiavelli um, or you know, the Judeo-Christian Judeo inspiration all have in common mm -hmm. is this idea that human nature is problematic, it's violent, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not straightforward um, at all what, what you do with this. Um, it's not sort of simply utopian or um, where we can say that everybody's fu fundamentally good. Where someone like Girard and Schmidt very much disagree is that um, Girard believes that once you describe this, it has this dissolving effect. So scapegoating violence only works if you don't understand what you're doing. And so if we say, well, we have, we have a crisis in our village and we're going to have a witch hunt so that everybody can you know, get out all their negative energy and you know, we'll target this one elderly woman, um, that only works if you don't think of it as a fake psychosocial thing. Right. Once you think of it in those terms, it stops to work. And so there's sort of a, there is this sense of late modernity where this unraveling has been, for Girard, an ambiguous thing. It's both, it's both a bad thing because there are these cultural institutions that were the only way we had ever had of working and they're, they're unraveling, but it's also inevitable. We can't somehow put the genie back into the bottle. And, uh, and so the, uh, the Girardian critique of Schmidt would be that, uh, that somehow when Schmidt says politics is about friends and enemies, um, he's being so explicit. Schmidt thinks by being explicit that he's strengthening politics, but maybe it has this effect of, um, of undermining it. And, uh, right. and this is, I think, you know, there's elements of this that one sees in, you know, in the contemporary scene in the US where there, you know, there's something about it that's super intense, but then also you know, is super fake at the same time. That's that's sort of what what right. uh, what people what people what people see, and 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 it doesn't quite work when it's when it's simply fake. Peter Thiel, I'm quoting you again. <clears throat> we are at an impasse. On the one hand, we have the newer project of the Enlightenment, which perhaps always came at too high a price of self stultification. Again, the Enlightenment looks at three centuries of religious warfare in Europe and says we're going to st we'll just rule those questions. Mm -hmm out of order, stop asking them. And Peter Thiel and Carl Schmitt say, yes, but that leads to a narrow, small life, okay? On the other hand, we have a return to the older tradition. Now, elsewhere in your essay, you're talking about uh, terrorism in the third world and uh, Islamic radicalism. We have a return to the older tradition, but that return is fraught with far too much violence. That is to say, places in the world where they are asking the first, about first things, right. first principles, human nature, 
the nature of God, there seems to be violence involved. And so we're, so we're at an impasse. Now, soluble or insoluble? Well, it's always easier to describe problems than to solve them. Right. This is, this, this is uh, certainly a case in point. So, uh, yeah, so the impasse, if you frame this in more uh, scientific or technological terms, mm -hmm. the impasse is that the weapons we have, um, the technology is such that, you know, we could probably destroy the world many times over, and there's some point at which this sort of breaks down. You know, maybe World War I didn't make that much sense. People still thought it made sense pre-World War I. They still thought there was such a thing as a winnable war. Debatable in the cases of World War I and World War II, but certainly, you know, by, by the time you get to, say, 1970 and you have enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world 20 times over, um, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. And, uh, and I think one, you know, I, I, I've, I've spoken a lot in different contexts about the sort of t technology stagnation that yes, we've had yes. we'll come to in the last uh, 50 years. Mm -hmm. but, but sort of one way to relate the tech stagnation mm -hmm. to this theme is that, uh, is that uh, it was just not motivated anymore. You know, if you can think of the Manhattan Project, the Apollo space program were, had military motivation. Maybe the space program ended in 1975 when we had the Apollo Soyuz docking. If we're just going to be friends, why do you have to work 80 hours a week, you know, around the clock? And, uh, and there is a certain sense in which I would like to see us accelerate technological and scientific innovation um, back to, you know, the rate at which these things were progressing the first half of the 20th century. But uh, you can't motivate it by um, building, you know, more advanced weapon systems, and and then um, it's not clear we found a substitute for that. Okay. Now, you taught a course here at Stanford. I'm not. Uh, I'm sticking with the impasse for a moment, because you taught a course here at Stanford last year, and I have a couple of undergraduate friends who took notes and slipped me their notes, and uh, and then I looked over the syllabus. So there's one one reading that you gave the kids that fascinates me. I'm not sure you presented it quite this way, but it almost seems as though there's an underlying suggestion that it's the way out of the impasse, or it's an a way out of the impasse. Now, you, I, I, my, this, my hopes are, are high, Peter. Don't, if you dash them, just let me down gently, would you please? So here's the tech. You used the 2006 address at Regensburg by Pope Benedict XVI, not the current pontiff, his predecessor, the theologian, the shy theologian, Benedict XVI. The Pope, again, this takes a little moment or two to set up, but I'm just set it up and then I get out of the way and let's see what you do with it. He makes a couple of assertions. The first concerns the reasonableness of religious belief. And he quotes an exchange between a 14th century Byzantine emperor and his Muslim captors in which the emperor tells them they're wrong to impose religion by force. Benedict XVI in the speech. He asks, is the conviction that acting unreasonably contradicts God's nature merely a Greek idea, or is it always and intrinsically true? Modifying the first book of Genesis, the first book of the whole Bible, John, the Apostle John, begins the prologue of his gospel with the words, in the beginning was the Logos. John thus spoke the final word on the biblical concept of God, and in this word all the often tortuous threads of biblical faith find their culmination and synthesis, close quote. All right, huge amount there, but the fundamental idea is that properly understood, faith is reasonable. It's not merely, the idea of the reasonableness of faith is not merely a cultural construct that belongs in one place or one time. It is intrinsically, faith is intrinsically reasonable. The Enlightenment got that wrong. And we, we need somehow or other to, reunite, to, to grasp the reasonableness of the first questions that will enable us to ask them once again. Right? Well, this is, you know, there's a lot that we'll, one can unpack I'm just going to shut up. This. I'll let you take there's it There's a lot there. that we can unpack in all of this. Uh, I, I would say that... It's fun, though, isn't it? It's, this is, wow, this is like, this is a harder interview than I was expecting, Peter. <laughs> Way harder than I was expecting. Uh, I think that, uh, I think it is a little bit tricky to say both that it's, you don't want faith to be unreasonable. You don't want it to be merely reasonable because right, then you could just right. use reason. <laughs> and so it's always a little bit of a complicated question of how, how you get uh, faith, faith and, and reason to, to work together. The, um, 
I'm, I'm naturally quite sympathetic to um, to the Benedict um, position, position right, right. Uh, and approach in a lot of ways. And yet, um, the, um, the, from a literary point of view, what was so int fascinating about reading the Regensburg Address, where it was, you know, he was maybe uh, using this 14th century Byzantine emperor maybe as a mouthpiece for, for the, the pro-reason thing. We know what happened to the Byzantine Empire. It sort of fell apart shortly thereafter. Short, very shortly and, thereafter. Uh, and the suspicion one has is maybe um, the Byzantine emperor in the 14th century should not just have been making reasoned arguments, but should have also been getting some weapons and protecting himself from um, um, what was, um, you know, the disaster that was about to, to befall the, the Byzantine Empire. And, uh, and then um, the, the, the thought I had in looking at the speech from the point of view of 2019 um, that I wonder about is, was there something about it that was somehow prophetic of something going wrong with sort of rationalist conservative Catholicism where, um, you know, Benedict is just like the 14th century um, Byzantine em emperor and maybe even though I'm pro-reason and I think we live in a society where people don't respect reason enough, he somehow believed in it too much and, um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, my, I, I'm not, not Catholic like, like you and I, I've always, I always have a two-word rebuttal of Roman Catholicism to all my conservative Catholic friends. It's just uh, Pope Francis. And, um, okay. and, and there, were, there was something about... Uh, you get to say that now. If I start on those, I just add 10,000 years can, just, to my you, time you, in purgatory. You, you, you can just have me back on your show. Yeah, exactly. You can do that. Okay, but, okay. But so that's, that's, that's the... So it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating speech, but, uh, so but you, it can be you, unpacked on all these levels. So I read the Re Regensburg Address <laughs> in your syllabus and I thought, ah, Peter's offering, here's the way out of the impasse. And you're saying, no, not exactly. I take that as a warning. To place too much faith, place too much faith in the reasonableness of faith or in reasonableness itself. And, and 10 years later, everything you stood for will be wiped out. Well, I think, look, I, th I, think, uh, I think we have to always try to go back to um, intellect, mind, rationality as, as core values. And there are, there are ways in which we've, we've uh, gone too far from them. But at the same time, I also think there's something to be said for it can't be just interiority. We also should be, you know, acting okay. in our world. We should be, uh, we should be, um, you know, we shouldn't be in the sort of yoga, meditative, psychological retreat. And uh, and that's the that's and then and then there are, and then there's sort of all these ways where science and technology, um, you know, that that were sort of the that there was such a big driver of, of progress for centuries. There's so many parts of these that uh, no longer feel positive to people, okay. and that uh, that feel like a retreat. I'll, I'll give a I'll give a Silicon Valley yeah. version of this. Uh, you know, I was I was involved in the early 2000s in a lot of the uh, futuristic AI initiatives. Um, you invested in uh, there's um, a Singularity Institute. There were sort of all these groups, and it was, right. the basic premise was you know AI is going to happen. It's going to be if, if it happens, it's this very important. AI, you, hold on, you better just for viewers, you better explain. Um, give a, give us a two sentence definition of AI. Yeah, it means all these different things, but the the context in which they used it was sort of the science fiction version of AI. So super duper smart computers that can do anything, and they're going to be very powerful. So smart and, they'll seem like humans, and or maybe even smarter than humans. Right. And it's very important whether or not they're friendly or unfriendly. And this was sort of an important problem that we needed to solve. And, and circa 2003, it felt like, okay, we don't know which way it's going to go. And uh, we need to, to work on it. And if you had to score it circa 2019, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's far more pessimistic. And people now believe they know what's going to happen at the singularity, that the AI is going to kill every human being on this planet. That's what people actually believe. And, Including um, you? Uh, well, I'm, I, I'm, we can be skeptical how fast it happens, you know, but, but no, that's the, that's the general zeitgeist, even in Silicon Valley, okay. even in Silicon right. Valley. Right, Certainly right, right. anyone who watches a science fiction movie believes that. Right. And um, your point is that this valley, then, which used to be bright and hopeful, has gone very dark. And so maybe if you're an AI researcher, you should be working on it very, very slowly. And you're going to be somewhat less motivated to work on it. And uh, it has a very different has a very different sort of a sort of a feel to it, and so even even this sort of uh, fairly theoretical part of computer science that's more in the world of bits than the world of atoms has um, has shifted into this much more apocalyptic direction where you know the um, where you know 2003 2004 it was we need to move as fast as we can, and now it's it's sort of like the precautionary principle, and maybe 
you know, we should be scared of our own shadow and just be very, very slow. And that's happened even in, um, even in computer science, All right. which was one of the healthier fields still 20 years ago. All right. Um, contemporary politics, the issues of the day, China. What went wrong? Let me be a simple quotation here. The late economist and foreign policy analyst, my colleague here at the Hoover Institution, Harry Rowan. Harry Rowan, by the way, was a lovely, humane, highly intelligent man. I say that because I'm about to make a, read a quotation from him that suggests he was just mistaken. He wasn't always mistaken. He wrote this in 1996. When will China become a democracy? The answer is around the year 2015. This prediction is based on China's steady and impressive economic growth, which in turn fits the pattern of the way in which freedom has grown in Asia and elsewhere in the world. Close quote. Economic growth was supposed to lead to democracy in China, and that wasn't madness. There was the example of South Korea. Mm -hmm. First they got rich, and then they became democratic. And of Taiwan, they got rich, and then they became democratic. And you could argue that uh, um, the American foreign policy establishment has lost a quarter of a century expecting things to go right in China, and they haven't. How come? Well, I think these things, you know, um, these things are, are always somewhat overdetermined, but maybe, maybe if I had to come up with a simple um, mistake that people made was, uh, it was way too deterministic a view of history. There's nothing automatic about the way history uh, can happen, and uh, it's, it's, it's not that you get to you know, $8,000 per capita GDP and you automatically become a democracy. Uh, these things can go, go in a lot of different directions. There's, there's a great deal of contingency. And uh, if I had to pick on you a little bit, Peter, here, it would be that, uh, you know, there's the, that, that speech that you helped uh, Ghost Rider write, right. uh, tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev. Yes, yes. And, um, and it was effective. And the Berlin Wall came down in 89 and um, communism fell in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union. Stop there. But we can't stop there. We can't. <laughs> because because th there were other people who paid attention to this, and there were people in China and East Asia who paid attention to this, and they drew some very different lessons. And the lesson they drew was that um, we have to make sure that we keep the Leninist part of the state running very strongly. We can have, um, you know, you can have, um, uh, perestroika, you can have restructuring, but you can't have glasnost. And we're going to decouple them, and we're going to learn the opposite lesson because, yeah, you, you op open things up just a little bit too much, and things fall apart. And then, and I think, yeah, I think for, you know, 28 years, I'd say at least 89 to 2017, um, we basically in the West read the events of 89 as that was inevitably going to happen in the East, mm -hmm. and China read them, it's not going to happen because we'll learn we're going to learn from history. We're going to make sure it doesn't happen here. And the exact same events were interpreted in, in uh, different ways. And uh, they were probably not going to happen because China wasn't going to let them. And we were oblivious to this because we were just so convinced of this determinacy of, of history. Right. The, you know, the, the riff I always have on this is that uh, 2017, 2018 is, is the year that Xi became president for life. And that's the year that Fukuyama's end of history definitively came to an end. But, uh, you know, there are all these reasons you could have said, you know, right. there, was, there was a lot of evidence earlier that things were off. Okay. Uh, in your book, Zero to I'm quoting all kinds of things. At least I get high marks for yes. doing my homework for yes, you, Yes, the Peter. quotes are accurate. Okay. In your book, Zero to One, quote, China is the paradigmatic example of globalization. Its 20-year plan is to become like the United States is today, close quote. So China, this is, this is another, uh, I think, dated thought, but I'll let you tell me. China can only copy it is incapable of genuine innovation on its own. And as long as the United States remains innovative, then we have the hope of remaining a step or two ahead of them. Yes? Uh, yes, I agree with that, but I, I would read it a little bit differently. So I think, I, I do think that uh, the West is still far more innovative than, 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 um, than China, um, but um, if you're only one or two steps ahead, that's not very much. And so if things are copied very quickly, then maybe you don't need to innovate at all. You can um, outsource all the very hard R&D work to, um, to the West. Uh, you have a lot of deadweight economic costs associated with that. And then if you can just steal all the IP, it might, that might even be you know, a more efficient way 
to um, to um, innovate, and you're maybe you're six months behind, but um, you don't have to be behind that far. And okay. so I think that's, you know, I think that's roughly the way to think of um, a lot of the contemporary um, sort of technology races. To, you know, you know, if there's innovation happening in AI, and I, I think most of the breakthroughs, or just about all the breakthroughs, I believe, have happened in the West, but uh, they they get transmitted to China within six to twelve months, and so. That's that's the that's kind of dynamic of we have. Margin for us. So right. we we're, yes, we're innovating, but it only gives you so much. Now you have said uh, actually this is something else I have in here, but I'm not going to take the time to go back and find it. That one of the sig I'm, so I'll paraphrase you instead. One of the signal accomplishments of the Trump administration is causing everybody to rethink, to reevaluate China. How is so? Trump, we've got a number of different, what's getting all the attention is the trade policy, slapping on tariffs. The Wall Street Journal yes. takes one whack at him after another's, arguing that we're harming ourselves. Bob Zellick and the journal this morning mm -hmm. was arguing we're doing far more harm to ourselves and our own trading partners than we are to China. Then you've also got, I believe, you'd know more about this than I, but I believe there are also stepped up intelligence efforts and stepped up enforcement efforts concerning uh, technology transfers. Just a sort of open-ended question. How is the Trump administration doing in terms not just of waking everyone up to the danger of China, but the actual implementation of specific policy? Well, I think, I think this is all still very much a work in progress. Right. I, I do think that uh, there has been a sea change on the, uh, on the perceptions with China. And in, right. in a way, the, the way I, I think of U.S. politics is it's, yeah, it's badly tribal. It's too polarized. Most of the times we just have this trench warfare with the two parties fighting each other. No one makes much progress. It's when you really win on issues when you get the other side to agree with you. Right. And I believe that on the China issue, the Trump administration has gotten the entire center left to left to, to agree with them. I think maybe, maybe Biden is still the one pro-China um, candidate uh, running. And that, that seems like a catastrophic albatross for him in the Democratic primary uh, this year, I think all the others are um, are probably as anti-China or as tough on China as uh, as the president is. Maybe they'll be even tougher if they get in, because um, to some extent the Trump administration policies are still moderated by we're trying not to hurt American businesses, and uh, I suspect the uh, the Democrats will be less concerned about uh, about business. Got it. But right. uh, but I think I think there's been a there's been a sea change a sea change on that. Um, yes, and of course, the free trade theories are correct in theory. They're all sorts of, um, but in, in the real world, this stuff is always super messy. And if you're negotiating a free trade treaty, you want the person negotiating it to be one who's not a do doctrinaire free trader, because a doctrinaire free trader will believe that the worse a job they do negotiating, the better a job they're doing. Because right. if you, you know, um, even if even if you, you um, concede everything and you get nothing from the other side, there still are these gains from trade. And that's what free trade doctrine always tells you, that you don't need to work very hard on these trade treaties. Um, and the U.S. is really the only country in the world that, uh, that believe that. You know, um, you know Western Europe, um, Japan have, in effect, far higher um, you know, they have, uh, barriers to trade. You have, you have um, tariffs in the form of VAT taxes. You know, fifteen right, to twenty right, percent sure. across the board on goods in, um, you know, Western Europe, Japan, and uh, and you know, it's there's a, there's a, yes, if we got rid of all that, m maybe that would be a sort of more efficient world. But uh, we've obviously gotten to a very very unbalanced point. You know, the other the other metaphor I always give on this is that, uh, you know, the basic flow is we have you know five hundred billion dollars that we import from China, one hundred billion a year that we export to China, and in effect four hundred billion dollars of cash flows uphill from being saved by poor Chinese peasants and being invested in low-yielding U.S. government bonds. And so if you're looking at this from outer space, that alone tells you that it's just, it's just a completely crazy regime. But, and that some, but that, what, that, what about, well, what, what, if they want their peasants to finance our government debt, why not? Uh, well, right? if that's, if that's in, the free, in, tra free trade argument, but, right? But if we believed in globalization, yes. the way globalization is supposed to work is the Less developed countries are supposed to converge. They converge, they grow faster, therefore you get a higher return on investing in them, and therefore capital should be exported from the developed to the developing countries. That is the direction in which capital 
uh, flowed circa 1900, right. when the United Kingdom had a current account surplus of 4% of GDP, and the extra capital was invested in Argentinian bonds and Russian railroads and all these different things. And you know, the, the globalization ended badly in 1914, in the late 19th, 20th century, but that at least made sense. Yes. It, the money flowed in the correct direction. This time, we're in a much crazier form where um, the money is flowing the, the wrong way. That's not what Ch Chinese peasants shouldn't be saving money in low yield in government U.S. bonds or negatively yielding European bonds. They should be, you know, investing in China where they should be getting a higher return, and so should we. All right. I want to come back to Trump in a moment, but first, it, sort of a summary question about China: population of 1.3 billion, intense work ethic, the ability to to deploy capital and infrastructure. Everybody says, including you have told me this, you go to China and the airports are dazzling and the trains run fast and they're clean and efficient. And of course now they have a habit of rapid economic growth. And in the long contest to come between the United States and China, what have we got? Democracy, a free press, innovation that keeps us six months ahead? Are you optimistic? Well. It's very hard to, to score. I, I, I would say the, 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 although my pessimist- I'm hoping you my, cheer me up well, on this. My, my neutrally pessimistic description <laughs> is, is that, um, you know, if you, if you scored it, I think both sides think they're going to lose. I think the United States thinks that, yeah, it's, it's sort of like this declining power, but, uh, but China does not think it's going to win. You know, it's, you have a demographic collapse. Right, right. Um, you know, anyone who uh, makes money tries to get their capital out of the country. People are still, you know, if at all possible, trying to, to get out of China. Um, and so, so if you sort of, if you were to try to, you know, psychologically score the two sides and say, who believes they're going to win? Um, uh, actually, they both think they're going to lose. So and, and I, you know, I, even if you think you're going to win, doesn't mean you're going to win. Although I think if you think you're better going way to, to lose, go through life, though. if you think you're going to lose, you will lose. You know, if, right. you th if you think you're going to get an A on a test, you don't always get an A. If you think you're going to get an F, you always get an F. Right. And uh, right. and so so what's what's very confusing is I think uh, I think both sides think they are so they're going to lose. I told a lie. One more question about China. You said a moment ago that in the 50s and 60s, a lot of the technological progress was driven in effect by the Cold War, by the need the military mm -hmm. need to develop technology. Which reminds me of, again, I can't quote this, I can only paraphrase it, but there's some place in fairly early George Kennan, one of the diplomats uh, and important mm -hmm. writers in the Cold War, fairly early George Kennan, in which he wrote that he welcomed the long struggle to come between the United States and the Soviet Union because it would bring out the best in the United States. We had nothing to fear from this as long as we lived up to our own best traditions. He, he, he expected it to be a bracing struggle. Struggle between China and the United States help us technologically? Will it be good for our character? Well, the Cold War, you know, we won the Cold War, but, uh, but there are a lot, of, a lot of different ways that could have gone. So I'm, I'm not you'd quite rather, sure. You'd rather I'm not. not. Totally, I'm not totally <laughs> convinced of that. But I think, <coughs> yeah, I think, I think that, uh, I think the future, the future version of, um, um, you know, um, I do think uh, that we, we the, the future that China represents is not a future that is that is particularly desirable. I was I was struck by this when I was in uh, Western Europe um, a few months ago. That uh, I think I think the future is something that always has to be thought of in relatively concrete terms, and it has to be different from the present. And only something that's different from the present and very concrete can have any sort of charismatic force. And and looking at Western Europe, I would say. There are, there are basically three plausible futures on offer. Number one is um, Islamic Sharia law, and if you're a woman, you get to wear a burqa. Um, uh, number two is um, totalitarian AI uh, a la um, China, where um, the computers track you in everything you do all the time, um, and that's kind of creepy, sort of the, 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 the eye of Sauron, to use the Lord of the Rings references, right. watching you at all times. And then the third one is, um, is hyper-environmentalism, where, where you uh, drive an e-scooter and you, you recycle. And uh, even though I'm not, you know, I'm not a radical environmentalist, um, 
I think if those are the three choices, you can understand why the green movement's winning. Right. Because th those are the three visions of the future we have. Right. And, uh, and the challenge, the challenge uh, on the conservative or libertarian side is, is to offer something that's, that's a picture of the future that's different from, from these, these two very dystopian and one somewhat stagnant one. Okay. A note from a friend of mine, young friend of mine, who took, this is a note that he took in your class. So this isn't in your syllabus, it's something you said in class. If you've got economic growth, you can solve most problems. This brings us to Donald Trump. We've got economic growth. Now the 3% seems to have cooled as we sit here talking, and maybe it's going to average out this year at something between 1.8, 2.4, something like that, but it's economic growth. May we all relax? Well, Reagan, we got 6% growth in 83, 84, 85. We got something like 6% growth almost three years in a row. So, um, so it's, yeah, uh, two or 3% is, is definitely better than, than nothing. The, the, um, the, uh, the question on, on, the, on the Trump administration is, can we keep going with this for the next decade? And, um, and I, think, you know, I think in some ways, um, the president will get reelected if people believe that this sort of growth is going to be sustainable for, for, for the next decade. That's the future he offers. It, and that's, it, you know, it's, it's not quite as exciting as Reagan, but it's still, um, you know, two, two to three bad. percent for, for a decade. We will gradual, things will gradually get better. We will work our way out of a lot, out of a lot of these uh, challenges. And then, um, and then the, the concern is if it's, if it's just this temporary blip driven by too much debt, too much things like that, then, um, then um, Joe then again, Biden or Elizabeth Sanders starts, Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Sanders. They might as well be. Uh, um, Bernie Warren or Elizabeth Sanders start to look okay. The socialists are, right. you know, not to be underestimated. Do you, it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a Marxist theory that, uh, that, you know, the Marx, the time for communism would come when interest rates went to zero. Because the zero percent interest rate was a sign that the capitalists no longer had any idea what to do with their money. And therefore... There, was, there are no good investments left. That's why the rates are zero, and therefore all that you could do at that point was redistribute the capital. And so I'm, you know, it's it doesn't mean zero percent rates lead us to socialism, but uh, it but is always something sign. that I find I find it alarming that the rates are as low as they are. Last question about Donald Trump: Do you expect to endorse him? Uh, I, yes, I, I mean, and I, I certainly will not endorse any of his any of his opponents. All right, uh, a couple of cl closing questions here. We became friends when you were still a student here at Stanford. Imagine, imagine a young Peter Thiel listening to us now. Peter Thiel himself, Stanford undergraduate, Stanford Law School, practiced law at a big fancy firm in New York for seven months and then said, this is horrible, came out here and in, began investing in tech. But now Peter Thiel himself has the Thiel Fellowships, which are to entice really bright kids to drop out of college. And you've just sat here telling us that the, 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 the valley that you came back to from New York and began investing in is not the valley of today. Things have gone dark. So what path would you recommend to an 18 or 20 year old now? Wow, you know, it's, these are always such hard questions to, um, to answer. And I think even if I knew all these things, I'm not sure uh, what I would have done. And of course, that's a, that's a fake thought experiment. You know, the question, uh, looking back, would be when I graduated, undergraduate in 1989, what, um, what are some different choices I would have done? And like, I, I think I should have, the advice I, I would, the reasonable advice I'd give my uh, former self from 30 years ago would be something like, um, just think a lot harder about the future. Don't think of education as a substitute for the future. Um, you know, try to think concretely what, what you want to do. And, and, uh, and there's something about the sort of um, tracked educational system that, again, um, get, it gets packaged as a form of thought, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a substitute for thought. It's a substitute for the future. And, um, and yeah, you have to, it's, it's, you probably don't want to do the things that are hyper competitive that, that you know, that everybody's doing. Uh, there's, you know, and I think there's always a question, you know, where's the frontier, where are there some pockets of innovation, where, where you can do some, some new things and um, not be in, uh, you know, in a, in a crazed competition. But that's, 
That's that, that was a hard question to answer then. I think it's a harder one now, but I think it's still the right question to ask. All right. It's always my, you know, it's always the contrarian intellectual question. Tell me something that's true that nobody Yes, agrees yes, with you. yes. This is your favorite um, question. Go you know, what, what is, what's a good career that other people aren't pursuing? You know, the, the, politically, yes, the, yes. Politically, the politically incorrect career, engineering career is petroleum engineering. Got you know, it. so it's, 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 it's super lucrative and there just are, um, you know, for ideological reasons, not enough people go into it. All right. So that's, that's, a, that's a straightforward ideological answer. All right, so here's the last question, Peter. You're still investing, but you're teaching classes at Stanford, you're fielding telephone calls from the White House. At this stage in your life, what are you trying to accomplish? You all, you, you're, you're famous for saying having a plan, you, you, you may not follow the plan, but having a plan is better than no plan. What are you thinking over the next five years or 10 years for you? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know, this, is, this, always, this always sounds too, too ambitious or too grandiose, but you've, I, you know, I, 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 um, I would like to get our, our society, I would like our society to get back to the future to get back to, um, to a society that's, that's uh, you know, um, progressing in, in all, these, um, all these important dimensions. Uh, and there's sort, of a, you know, there's sort of a very local way of doing that, which is investing in futuristic technology companies. So that's a small, you know, manageable way you do this. And then there's sort of our you know, broader conversations like the one we're having today where um, we, try to, we try to get people to, to think about this topic. But it's... Uh, yeah, we, sh we, we need to think about, you know, the future arrives, it will be different from the present, and if we don't think about it, it's much less likely to be a good future than if we, uh, if we work to craft it. Peter Thiel, thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson. Mm -hmm.